Ooh, look at that. I can put the widgets anywhere on the home screen now. Yes! Why do the small things sometimes seem to mean so much? Welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be diving into iPadOS 17. Currently, I'm rocking the latest version of the public beta, but seeing that the Apple event is less than a week away from the time of this video, I'm going to guess this version is pretty much at the finish line and, and using it, and has been really stable, though I have run into a few minor bugs. Let's get into it. First off is the lock screen. Coming fresh off the heels of its little brother iOS 16 are customizations for the iPad that are probably very familiar to what you're already used to doing. Now, one of my favorite things aesthetically on my iPhone was not necessarily that you could change the clock font or size or even the color, though it was certainly a nice ad, but the ability to have these large commanding photos that place themselves ahead of the text every time you unlocked your device was awesome. And with iPadOS 17, you get all this. Change the font, change the text color, choose a wallpaper from your own photo library or peruse some of the latest offerings from Apple like these planets. Seriously, who doesn't like planets? If you have live photos, your iPad will play them nice and slow in the background for you with some smooth animation to make the screen come to life. To do all this, hold down your finger on the screen to put it in the edit view. Here you can customize your current screen or swipe over to start a new one from scratch, much like your iPhone or Apple Watch if you have one. What's really cool is you can make different versions for your focus modes, which could be personal versus work, or, or like me, I like having the moon at night. So make it how you want and boom, Bob's your uncle. Also making their way to the lock screen are widgets, but not just any widgets, but interactive widgets. Yes, you can actually just tap to complete your to-dos right from the moment you access your iPad versus having to unlock, go to your home screen, and then into your reminders app. If you want to turn on the Christmas tree, just pick up your iPad and click the button. It's that easy. We're finally taking advantage of the larger iPad display, which for years has been a wide, open, blank canvas. Live activities also come to iPadOS. So if you want to know the latest on sports scores or the progress of a food delivery order, you can now do this from these simple widgets. We can even do multiple timers now all at once. Hoo hoo hoo! When you add widgets to the home screen, the options only go up from there. Start playing your music library, control your house, and be ready for third parties to unleash many more ideas of their own. You can edit these much like the lock screen we previously went over. Simply hold your finger on the screen and click the add button in the top left corner. And voila, you are adding widgets. As you scroll through, you'll see a number of default options from Apple, as well as third party options based upon the apps you currently have installed on your device. Another big update is you can now have widgets anywhere on the screen. In iPad OS 16, they always had to be adjacent to apps, and there was always this maddening shuffle that was happening as you moved widgets around on the screen. Now, if you want one widget in the middle of the screen, you can do that. Though I'm not totally sure why you'd waste a screen just to do that, but the point is we have options. We have flexibility, and I love it. Now let's talk about Stage Manager. I think better ways of multitasking and juggling apps is something many of us want on the iPad, especially as more and more of us look at it as a laptop replacement. But the implementation of Stage Manager in iPad OS 16 was something that left us desiring more. In fact, most people I knew, including myself, turned it off pretty quickly after playing around with it. But in this iteration, Apple has made good strides in providing the user more flexibility and freedom with what they can accomplish on screen. Say you want to resize a window. Using this curved line in the corner, you can now pretty freely resize the window how you want it. Yes, it's still locking you into some default dimensions, but Apple is mostly preventing you from something you shouldn't be doing anyways, like making the app so small it is unusable. Moving Windows has also been given much more freedom as you can place items virtually anywhere on the screen with minor limits. Apple has done a good job with how the other windows react as you're moving items around to ensure things are clickable for easy switching. If you have a stage open and want to add another window, the fastest way is to hold shift on your keyboard and then tap the app you want to put alongside what you already have open. No keyboard? No problem. In a similar fashion, put a finger on the three dots at the top, hold it until you can tell the iPad sort of notices what you're doing, and then go ahead and tap another app and your stage is now built. You may then cycle through your stages on the left side if you wish to jump between apps to speed up your workflow. When using Stage Manager, I have sometimes found that there are apps I want to have as much screen real estate as possible. Let's say I'm watching YouTube and I also want to read the comments at the same time. 
If I do not have the app full screen, that just means I'm seeing less of just about everything. And so I will tap the dots at the top to enable the app in full screen view. Now this feature isn't new for iPad OS 17, but I figured I'd throw out the tip just in case it was helpful to folks as I really don't think most users even know a Sage Manager is or that it exists, except for uh, Apple fans like us who watch videos on YouTube about operating systems. Don't judge us. Now I'm personally undecided if I'm going to keep Sage Manager turned on, but I'm willing to give it a solid go in the name of science. Apple has given us much more familiarity and flexibility, which I appreciate. If it doesn't work out, that's fine, but it's good to know that Apple continues to evolve this feature, and I'm certainly looking forward to how this transforms in future OS updates. Now with Safari, we haven't seen anything major, but the slow evolution does continue. As a longtime Chrome user who still thinks Chrome is a fine browser, I will have to say that I have now been exclusively using Safari on all my personal devices for a few years now, and I couldn't be happier. There was a time where performance was lacking and compatibility issues were not all that uncommon, but I can say with confidence that this is no longer an issue for 99.99% .99 of things you're going to run into. If you are worried about data, about you, or your online activity, Apple seems to have the edge with having a stronger privacy focus, which I value. For iPadOS 17, you can now have Safari profiles. So for example, let's say you wanted to have separate tab groups, favorites, or search history for work and your personal life. You can now do that by setting up profiles. To set it up, I use Spotlight, which I cover in the next section, to quickly get to the Safari settings. There you can change the name, icon, and color of your new profile and how your favorites are saved. When you go back to Safari, you'll now be able to toggle between profiles in the upper corner and all of your data will follow with you. Another neat feature is that you can now have private windows locked with Face ID and Touch ID in the instance you need to keep prying eyes off of sites they shouldn't see. Generally, the lock on the device itself would take care of this, but for example, if you handed your kids your iPad to play a game or check out recent vacation photos, you could ensure they don't accidentally find the website containing birthday presents you were researching for their upcoming party. That's what you were looking at, right? Spotlight gets some changes, and I'm going to be honest. While small, this is one of my favorite updates as I use Spotlight all the time. For those who are newer to Spotlight land or need a reminder of what it is, it is essentially the search function of your device, though I know that's slightly an oversimplification. To activate it, you pull down from the middle of your screen and your search bar will come into view. I've known friends who have painstakingly organized their apps into folders across multiple screens, but often there is no match for the speed and simplicity of pulling down and typing in two or three characters. Okay, I use both methods, but it is super handy for those apps you don't use all the time or are unsure where they are buried. With Spotlight and iPadOS 17, search is smarter and now you can toggle stuff straight from the search bar. Need to turn off Bluetooth or Wi-Fi? Easy. Need to start a new timer? Apple has your back. Now let's talk health. If you're one of those people that likes to see how many steps you have had or data on your latest workout, seeing health info was only possible on your iPhone or Apple Watch. For iPadOS 17, you now have a large, beautiful, well laid out app at your fingertips. Data is much more easy to see as it has been optimized for the design of the iPad display and jumping around between the different types of data is easier than it ever has been before. If you need to track and manage medications, log daily moods, or look at health records, this can all be done in one central secure place on the iPad. Annotation gets another boost in this year's release with improved features for PDF editing. Now, entering information in PDFs is easier than ever before because iPadOS 17 now uses machine learning to identify fields in a PDF so that users can quickly add details such as names, phone numbers, email addresses, and more all from your contacts. The new updates also shine in the Notes app where users have a new way to organize, read, annotate, and collaborate on PDFs. Flipping through pages, making highlights, and doing other markup with the Apple Pencil is a breeze. One feature we got in a previous release that I still don't think most people know about is the ability within the Notes app to scan documents right into a note. With this, you can take a picture of a form and immediately begin to fill it out with your finger or Apple Pencil. Now, while we may have been able to finally ditch having printers, PDFs are still one of those things that sort of linger around past or prime, and I wish more things were built around web-based forums and the like. But when used for your kids' school permission slips or for sports activities, I'll gladly just annotate a PDF and quickly share it via email versus booting up the inkjet and praying I still have paper. 
Keeping on the notes theme, it is now possible to link notes to other notes, which is useful for connecting two related ideas together, sort of like a wiki. To do this, you can either tap the screen next to your cursor and tap Add Link, or use a keyboard shortcut of Command-K. From there, you can add a normal URL to a website, or even start typing the name of a past note. As you begin typing, results matching your text will begin to show, and you can click the one you want to link. After you click Done, the link will appear within your note, and you may click to jump to the link's destination. Notes has also added an option for creating block quotes, as well as the ability to use a mono-styled format to really make your text stand out, such as if you were pasting in snippets of code or something else that you wanted to pop out from the rest of your text. With reminders, we definitely see some productivity hacks come our way. For example, there is a new intelligent grocery list experience that automatically breaks your foods into lists by category, so your next trip is as seamless as possible. This is going to be huge in our household, as we were already rearranging items in our grocery list by the store layout to prevent us from having to scroll up and down the entire list to ensure we weren't missing anything. Thank you to the person at Apple who made that one happen. You can also activate this new column view. So for those of you that are familiar with using Kanban boards, this could be a big win. To activate it, go to the menu and click View as Columns. Then go to Menu and add a new column. At this point, you can drag and drop items around and check them off to your heart's desire. If at any time you want to return back to your normal view, this can easily be done back under the menu area. Wrapping this up, I'll speed through a handful of other quick features in the Lightning Round. The Lightning Round. The Messages app now allows you to create your own stickers. You can have your own expandable menu with recently used stickers, and you are free to create them directly from your own photos. With FaceTime, you are able to leave an audio or video message when someone doesn't answer. FaceTime calls also get more reactions, such as hearts, fireworks, rain, and more. Give the camera two thumbs up and see what happens. If you happen to own an Apple TV 4K, FaceTime now will extend to your TV right from your iPad so you can see friends or family on the big screen, while utilizing the camera on your iPad to keep you in the conversation. Of course, with center stage, you will be sure to be perfectly framed within the shot, even if you happen to move around the room, which is super cool. Speaking of cameras, there is now support for external camera connections via the USB-C port on your iPad. If you want to use your mirrorless camera or a more traditional webcam, or even the camera on an Apple Studio display, you can now do that to get the best picture, whether on a video call or running a live feed. With enhancements to visual lookup, not only can you take pictures of things such as animals and plants and have your device identify them on the spot, but you can also take pictures of things like signs and symbols that you would see on your laundry tags, for example. And that'll help you decipher what they actually mean. Yeah, no one knows what any of those mean, so thank you. Autocorrect improvements have been made to the keyboard and inline predictive text helps you quickly finish sentences when you are typing. Oh, and let's not forget that the OS will eventually learn that you are indeed not trying to type ducking. Okay. If you know, you know. The Maps app now has allowed you to download maps and use them while offline. I suppose later is better than never, even if I can't imagine doing that too much with an iPad on the go. Do you think a calculator app is ever coming? Verification codes will now autofill during the login process, saving you even more steps? As if the little pop-up notification they already did to autofill the code wasn't good enough. But hey, life is good. Lastly, one of my favorite features for years has been AirDrop for transferring data to other people quickly, and in the case of photos or video, in full resolution. This fall, you'll see improved reliability and increased speeds with the new OS. This is going to be huge when you're transferring things that are a gig or two in size, as it can get a little dicey from time to time. And to come later this year is the ability for AirDrop Transfer to continue over the web in the instance where you walk out of Bluetooth and Wi-Fi range from the other person. That's it for this video. I hope you're looking forward to all this and more in the next iteration of iPadOS. Hit subscribe if you want to see an upcoming video going over iOS 17 for the iPhone, and we'll catch you next time.